Hello and welcome to Wolverhampton Literature Festival for a very special event. Kuli Kali has um, been involved in every single festival reading her poetry, but this is the first time we've actually had a chance to speak with her and um, find out about her rise to fame and her creative processes. So here I'll hand over to Cherry Doyle to introduce Kuli Kali. Thank you. And Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to In Conversation with Cully Coley. Cully is a Wolverhampton-based poet, mother, and full-time council worker whose amazing life story in the past 12 months has been told on the BBC News website and BBC One's Sunday Morning Live. I'm Cherry Doyle, and I'm going to be talking to Cully today a bit more intimately about her life, writing, and uh, being catapulted to stardom. Cully's also going to be sharing some poems with us today, and if you like what you hear and you want to read some more, uh, her pamphlet, Patchwork, is available at offerspress.co.uk. And we're going to open the event today with a reading from Cully of her poem, Ragdoll. Thank you. This is a poem I've been dedicated to all all ragdolls living with cerebral palsy. <coughs> Silk, linen, velvet, cotton, wool, made from all sorts, textures, fabrics, buttons, ribbons, hips made from zips, whoops a daisy and falling to bits. Her heart is made of golden fluff. Her smile is stitched shining bright. Now and again she's not there quite. Her spirit shines like ultraviolet light. Droops, dangles her limbs and neck. Durable to all types of wear and tear. Broken, damaged, here and there. People stare, she just does not care. Battling, juggling impossibilities. Shining, diamond, sequined eyes. Always ready to give you a surprise. Like a cartoon, she'll always survive. Has trouble with her physical being. Words tangle in the laces of her head. Still figuring out what you've just said. Jerking, jolting to the day she's dead. Thank you so much, Kali, and thank you so much for being here. I'm really honoured to be here to ask you some questions on behalf of our audience. And thank you for that really moving reading of a poem about cerebral palsy and those of us who read your story on the BBC News website and saw you on Sunday Morning Live know that your disability is a real central part of your story and um, you've been involved in many events, readings and talks which celebrate disability as well as blogging for disability arts online. So how does cerebral palsy influence your writing? Well, uh Cerebral palsy is part of my life. I've been, I was born with cerebral palsy. And what I want people to know is to realise what it's like to be in my shoes and be able to write it in, in, in a lovely celebration way rather than, you know, depressing. That's what I, I want the world to know that I am a person as, as well as being a disabled person. And I think that's a really, um, I think that's a really powerful thing to, to try and move the narrative of disability away from something which is sort of pity-centred and more towards a, a celebratory thing. And I know that um, you read your poem Ankle Bells in 2019 at the British Museum, didn't yes. you, for their purple light up event for International Disabled Persons Day and you're going to share that with us now aren't you? Yes. Right. It's called, the poem is called Bile. Bile is ankle bones which I forgot to wear today but no. <laughs> never mind. We can imagine them. <laughs> it's got some Punjabi words in ankle bells it's the pop file in Hindi and, and Punjabi. Bindi is what I'm wearing on my head here. 
and so Vark Comedian is a Punjabi lady's outfit. Fire. These tempting ankle bells, like the bangles on my arm, like my vibrant powder and paint, like my bindi on my forehead, like my twinkling jewelry, like my embroidered silver gummies, like the clinking of dishes, endorsing, defining, approving my beauty as a woman. Bells upon my ankles keep me faithful. Bells upon my ankles keep me cultured. Bells upon my ankles keep me from escape. Bells upon my ankles keep me anchored. Bells upon my ankles steal my liberty. Bells upon my ankles keep tabs on me. Bells upon my ankles a meaningless sacrifice. When I dance, I jingle. When I walk, I tingle. When I sit, I dangle dingle. When I'm in a cloud, I mingle. When I'm alone, I'm single. With you, my love, I shine. I am silence, simple and divine. So although you've performed all over the country, Wolverhampton, where we are now, is your home city. You've grown up here, you've brought up your own family here, your careers here, and obviously your, your writing and your friends. So what role does Wolverhampton play as part of your identity, and what do you love most about the city? Well, because I, I was only like two and a half when I came to Wolverhampton from India, and it's basically all I've ever known. I, I love Wolverhampton, and it's the people, the schools, the love that, that I've been given by people in Wolverhampton. And basically, it's the vibrant and the diversity of the city I love. I think a lot of people have quite a negative opinion of Wolverhampton, though, don't they? So obviously that hasn't been your experience. No, no, no. I think, I, I think if people think it's a dark city and backward city, but it's not. If you're living here, maybe for, for, for other people, like in London and South, they think we're backward. <laughs> <laughs> Well, quite early in your writing career, you came third in a poetry prize writing about Wolverhampton, didn't you? And your focus was the diversity yeah. of the city and the different voices that are here. So is that something that you really enjoy about the city, meeting lots of different people? Yes. There's lots of cultures, there's lots of different colours, creeds, and, you know, lots of different countries have mingled into one city. <laughs> yes. It sounds like a really wonderful place to base your family and, and to bring them up. So just remind us again who you've got at home with you. I've got three children. One, my, my eldest is 24 years old. Then I've got the second one, she, he's 20 years old. And my daughter, she's 15. And I've got my husband, I've got my parents-in-law. We've got seven people in the house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That sounds like a full-time job on its own, let alone, you know, your actual job and your writing and yes. all your performances. I mean, something that the people watching today might wonder is, how do you fit it all in? I mean, how do you make time for your own writing? Well, before my in-laws moved out to the next door house, which was a couple of years ago, I used to wake up early and spend an hour writing early and then in my lunch hour at work. And then when I came home, I went after, when I got, got a few minutes, I did my writing done. So literally anywhere you could squeeze it into your day. Yes. <laughs> so do you find fitting it in um, obviously difficult with the amount of things that you, other things that you have to do, but is it the fact that you love writing so much that makes you give it room in your life? Yeah, I have been writing since I remember 
I first used the keyboard, which was at Penn Hall School, and I was only about, say, about eight, nine years old. And I, through that medium, I got all my thoughts out, what I, what I couldn't say, out on paper. Mm. So it's something really special to you then that you've got to make yeah. room for, I suppose, as part of how you communicate to other people. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, I have what you were saying earlier about getting up early and writing in your lunch breaks. I think they're really good tips for other writers who might be struggling to fit writing into their own busy lives. Um, have you got any other hints, tips or advice for new writers or people who might be thinking about publishing their work? Yes, the first thing is to find a writing group. There's loads dotted the down the city and through that writing group you can gain people like-minded like yourself and you have a time slot to write whatever you want, you know, and that comes out. So a writing group is dedicated time to writing when, as you mentioned before, you struggle to fit it into your, your everyday life. Yes. If you can get to a writing group for a couple of hours a month, that gives you the dedicated time to, to yeah, write. Yes, it does, definitely. And obviously, you're a member of two local writing groups yourself. You've been running the Punjabi Women's Writing Group since 2018 yes. and co-running Blake and Hall Writers for much longer. So is it fair to say that being a member of those two groups has been quite important for you developing as a writer? It's been invaluable because I've met so many people and who have guided me, supported me, and they, they think... Like, I met my mentor, Simon Fletcher, and he really guided me through that dark tunnel to a light. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Simon Fletcher was uh, running Blake and Hall Writers when you joined, wasn't he? Okay, yes. and he sort of helped you to develop your, your voice and your writing. Yes, he um, did. You mentioned earlier about finding like-minded people. Obviously, the Punjabi Women's Writing Group is a, a very um, targeted group. So what is it that's particularly important for Punjabi women to get together in their own writing group? Well, first of all, it's very, very hard to get them all in one room <laughs> anyway. <laughs> because they've got so much, so much on the plates, the duty for wives, mothers, and you know, everything else, the work. It's like anybody else, but their culture is like suppressed mm. more than any other culture I know. So do you think that Punjabi women lack the opportunities to tell their stories through poetry and other forms of writing? Yeah, and they're untold stories, so lots of people are interested in those stories because they've never been told before. Mm. Mm. And you have... Uh, You've been very popular when you've been performing with the Punjabi women's group. Yeah. Um, all over the Midlands, so obviously people are really interested in hearing the stories. What do you think it is that attracts people? I think it's the different story and different angle from, you know, different perspective. Mm. And we're all colourful and we're bright. <laughs> you definitely <Sparkling>. are. <laughs> yeah. A feast for the eyes. <laughs> I think, um, as well, you know, if, if you're talking about um, a group of women who are struggling to tell their stories, um, which, which hasn't been done very often in the past, do you think it takes a lot of courage for Punjabi women to tell their stories? Yes. It's like, they've never ever brought their stories out on a platform in front of an audience of different cultures. They might, they might tell each other in the, in the home or in the family their stories, but they never come out the, and say it out aloud. Mm. And do you think then that audiences are, can pick up on that courage and are really responding to it? They have. They have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
sounds like a really worthwhile endeavour and um, they're performing as part of the festival as well, aren't they? Yes. So um, an opportunity for anyone who hasn't caught up with them to see them. Um, I'm going to rewind a bit now. So uh, you mentioned earlier about when you started writing at Penn Hall with a typewriter. Um, and we heard some great hints and tips from you earlier around joining writing groups. But when did you first start writing, creative writing? And when did you think that you might want to pursue it a bit more seriously? Well, about 11 years ago, I finished my novel. And it was about 300 page novel that thick. And I didn't know what to do with it. Absolutely no idea. And I, I met my, my, one of my colleagues at work and he, he was very helpful. And his name was Jeff Phelps. And he's a writer himself. He's a published writer and poet. And I, I asked him, what do I do with this book? He says, are you a part of a Blake and Hall, I mean, a, like, a part of a writing group. I said, no, he goes, go and join Blake and Hall writers group. So, and then he pointed me to the, the street development officer who was Simon Fletcher at that time. And it all started like that. And when I first went, went into the group, I was so shy, I didn't say a word to anybody. And what I wrote, a poet piece called mine. And when Simon Fletcher read it, he says, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Impressed from the get-go, that's a very good sign. Yeah. And that was my first piece pub published on Wolverhampton City Council website. And you're going to share that for us now, aren't you? Yes. Mine. I have a dream. Please don't influence it. It belongs to me. I have a delicate heart. Please don't break it. It belongs to me. I have peace of mind. Please don't disturb it. It belongs to me. I have to follow a path. Please don't obstruct it. It belongs to me. I have an amazing life. Please let me live it. It belongs to me. I have a choice. Please don't choose for me. It belongs to me. I have freedom. Please don't capture me. It belongs to me. I have incredible feelings. Please don't hurt me. They belong to me. I have a lot of love. Please don't hate me. Love is mine to share. I, I have, I'm on my material journey. Don't follow me. It won't be fair. So, I have a dream. It's my dream to be free. Thank you. And that beautiful poem that we just heard was also the first poem you performed yourself. Uh, earlier in your career when you were invited to perform at um, poetry readings. Yes. Other people read for you on your behalf. Yes. Um, I did a few times, obviously, as yes. you know. And although, personally, it's always a real honour to be trusted with somebody's work, I think that hearing you read that yourself really brings the heart into the poem. And since then, you've spent a lot of time developing your performance skills yes. so that you can read your own poems. So can you tell us a bit about your journey to getting there? Well, at first, when, when I was asked to read in front of a, an audience, I said, no way, I cannot do it. <laughs> no way. And I was scared because what people might think of me because I can't get my words out and being wobbly and falling might fall down, you know. I'd, I wanted something. I, I didn't have any, any confidence in myself. Mm. And one day, after all that, 
and I had lots of people reading for me. And people kept saying to me, you should be reading your work yourself. And I said, OK, I'll try it. And when I sat in front of the audience, I was shaking. <laughs> I would stay stage fright as well at the same time as my nervous nerves and disability. And then when the whole audience went quiet, they didn't know what to expect. But when I started reading and at the end of it, they fell in love with what I said. That's really, uh, really good to hear. And in that audience at that first reading, were there quite a few people that you knew who you'd spoken to in the past? Yes, yes lots of people I knew and some people that I'd never seen before. Did it help to have some familiar faces in the audience? Yes, I think so because it gave me some confidence that peop people who already know what uh, I'm capable of, of writing, it, w it was good for them to hear what I need to do it myself. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think having, um, having met you and having that confidence in your poetry and, you know, I, I think when you're relaxed, you're not as impacted by your cerebral palsy, yeah. but when you're nervous, you are. I think people who've seen you relaxed know your potential, and obviously, you've become more and more comfortable with performing and being in front of cameras and in front of an audience through the years, haven't you? Yes, I think. <laughs> well, you know, it's you're sitting hard. here today <laughs> reading for us and answering our questions, so yeah. I think you've come a long way from from having other people read your poems for you. Yeah. I think so. Are you proud of, of being able to perform your own work? Yes, I am. Very proud. I thought that I could never do it, and I've proved myself wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good thing. And yeah. I think that even uh, people without a disability uh, sometimes might struggle to, to get up in front of an audience and deliver it. So, yeah, um, yeah well done. <laughs> And when you started thinking about publishing your work in print, you self-published a chapbook called Ragdoll yeah. of Poems. Um, self-publishing sometimes has downsides, but did Ragdoll help develop your writing career? Absolutely, yes, because I put all the poems into one book myself and did, it, did all the formats, formatting and all the publicity myself and I'd, I'd, I had got printed 100 copies first and they just disappeared within a month so wow. I had to print some more and then some more and then some more 500 copies just went and I, and I couldn't believe it and people were really saying how lovely my work was and really I got some brilliant feedback but the downside is it's all the effort that we have to do to get the publicity. You've got to do it all yourself essentially haven't you? Yeah. So uh, as, as you mentioned earlier you formatted the book yourself and you arranged the performances and all the publicity so um, was that quite a lot of hard work? It was absolutely very hard work because it was time consuming, I was full time working, I had kids, I had in-laws, I had house, you know, everything, but I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I suppose the main benefit to you of, of self-publishing was that um, it demonstrated that you actually had an audience who yes was available to, to buy and to read and enjoy your work. And subsequently, you were, of course, picked up by Offers Press, who published uh, Patchwork, your pamphlet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, one of their biggest selling titles. Yeah. So what did it mean to you to become a published writer? It's a dream come true. I never thought that it would happen, but and it happened, and I'm really pleased. And not, not only that, 
I've asked, I've put some my, my stories out there, and people who have got cerebral palsy or dis other disabilities are relating to it. And that was something you mentioned earlier was really important to you to yeah. portray disability in a positive light and to tell your personal story. Yeah. You know, as a disabled woman and as a an Indian woman. So has, has this helped you to do that to get your story out there? Yes. It has, definitely. Brilliant. <laughs> and, and since 2016, when Patchwork came out, I mean, you've been published in magazines and journals, you've been commissioned to write poems, you've performed all over the place, and you were on Emma Pursehouse's Radio 4 uh, Black Country Dialect Poetry Programme, yeah. weren't you? But really, you were catapulted into the limelight by the BBC News article on your life and your subsequent appearance on Sunday Morning Live. So what's life been like for you since then? Very, very busy. <laughs> As if it wasn't busy enough already. Uh, yeah, I couldn't believe it because when the news article went out, I didn't even know it was going to go out. And I started receiving random emails saying, thank you, you are a wonderful lady, your poetry is beautiful. I thought, what's going on? <laughs> you know, and then, then somebody thought, said to me, you go on the news, news BBC News front, front page. I thought, what? <laughs> and it just went mad from there. So have you had a lot of messages from people who read the story? Because millions of people read the article and millions of people watched Sunday Morning Live, so... Yeah. Has that resulted in quite a lot of contact for you? I have. I've had all over the world contact from Italy, um, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, India, everywhere. <laughs> and how are you finding responding to these queries? I had to have help. <laughs> I had to get my friends to help me. <laughs> Um, my publisher to help me. I was all, I was going mad. I couldn't couldn't cope with it. <laughs> <laughs> but do you feel like uh, your uh, your profile locally has grown since your yes. story came out as well? It has. It has because with Hampton Council, they they they're my employers, and they were amazed that I made it to the BBC. <laughs> So they're very proud of me as well, and they, they've publicised me quite a lot all over Wolverhampton. That's really supportive. Yeah. That's really lovely. And of, of all the messages and the comments that you've had, have they been overwhelmingly positive, or have you suffered from any negativity? I've had 100% positive, not one single negative. Wow, that's quite amazing <laughs> for, for something being on the internet. <laughs> yeah. I think that's... That's really telling that your story has touched people in a way that makes them want to reach out to yeah. you in an overwhelmingly positive way. How does that make you feel? Very good. <laughs> and of course, you know, as we've been talking about getting your story out there, this is sort of the context behind your poems, isn't it? So it's helping to, to push your your background story to a wider audience as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. So with all this going on, you're still writing. <laughs> yes. So please tell us what is coming next from Cully Coley. In April this year, my next book, my full collection is coming out from El Office Press and it's called Wonder Woman. Oh, fantastic. How, how has that been, putting together a full collection in these pandemic times with all this going on as well? It's been really hard because, like, I've already talked to somebody face to face, but it's all been online, on Zoom, on Teams, you know. It's been a bit crazy, really. But now we've got everything all, all together now, so it's all ready to get published. And are you looking forward to launching it? Yes. April the 13th. April the 13th? Yeah. You've got a date for it. Fantastic. And we're definitely looking forward to reading it. I know a lot of uh, Cully Coley fans out there have been anxiously awaiting another book, so I'm sure this will be music to their ears. 
So can you give us a taster from the book? Will you read us a poem? Yes, hurry up. This was also published on the website, BBC News website. It's called Sub Survivor. It's a villa now. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. I hid away, embarrassed. I was a disgrace. Lord, I survived this sentence, a tough test. A child who was compared with all the rest. I was different, an alien from outer space. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. Benefits, wages kept me together dressed. I was a cash point, abused without a case. Flawed, I survived this sentence, a tough test. On display to men for marriage suppressed. I was a, was a British visa for Asian men to chase. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. A lucky escape, rescued by a husband, blessed with a family that I could love and embrace. Lord, I survived this sentence, a tough test. My dreams came true, and all were impressed. A valued writer, poet, working mum, a place. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. Lord, I survived this sentence. Test. Wow, thank you so much. What an emotional poem. And hopefully that's wet people's appetite for your new collection as well. I think uh, a lot of people watching today will want to keep up to date with the release and find out when you might be performing. So what's the best way for them to do that? Can they find you on social media? Yes, yeah, so, so, social media, Facebook, um, Twitter, or... Oh, oh. The other one. Instagram? <laughs> Are you on Instagram? I I'm think a website. so. <laughs> yes, your website as well, kulikoli.co.uk. Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so when we first started uh, publicising this event, we put out a call, didn't we, to the public to see if they had any questions they wanted to ask you. Yeah. So I've got a couple here for you, if you wouldn't mind answering them. Can you give three tips to new poets? on how to write a successful poem? Yes. The first tip is to read more established poetry because that will help you gain more ideas of how poetry is written. And also, number two, is to write from experience and the heart. And number three is to read draft a Keep me drafting your poetry until it looks good on a page.